On today's episode of Locked on Canucks, we take a look at the Athletics rankings of the Canucks pipeline. What will the Canucks radio rights look like for the upcoming season? And could this be the end of Niels Holglander's time in Vancouver? It is Locked on Canucks, and it starts right now. Your Locked On Canucks, your daily podcast on the Vancouver Canucks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Locked On Canucks, the show that keeps you locked in on all things Vancouver Canucks. I'm, of course, your host, Justin Pooney. I hope you guys are doing well on this fine summer evening of course you can find me at twitter at underscore process sports you can follow our show on twitter at locked on canucks please also like and subscribe to our youtube channel i want to thank you for making locked on canucks your first listen of the day we are free and available wherever you get your podcast services and guys this show today is interesting kind of like doug mccallum Surrey Mayor trying to open up a 60,000 seat stadium in Surrey, British Columbia, my hometown. Uh, and yes, yeah, most of you know, I love Surrey and I love representing that I am from Surrey. Uh, but the fact that Mayor Doug McCallum wants to build a 60,000 seat stadium in a part of Surrey and Cloverdale where there are no big buildings, there is nothing like that. And I don't foresee any professional teams coming to Surrey in the next 30 years. Uh, so hopefully this episode makes more sense than Doug McCallum right now. Um, so as I said in the open, we will take a look at the Canucks prospect pipeline. We will take a look at whether or not Niels Hoaglander is in a make it or break it season in Vancouver. But first, I want to stick with the media side of things of the Vancouver Canucks because... There's a lot of drama going on with the Canucks radio rights now or the audio rights for the Vancouver Canucks and their games. Of course, we all know the Canucks. You can find them on Sportsnet for your television rights where they have the, you know, one of the best crews in the game. And I think the best Bruce Shorthouse and John Garrett. Uh, I do, as you know, indulge in watching every Canucks game. So I look forward to October and so I can hear Shorthouse and Garrett every game, but they're Radio side has gone through a bit of change. Of course, they went from 1040 to 650, and now the deal with 650 is up. And now all the reports are coming out that the Canucks might just do an in-house broadcast. Uh, and cut that main, cut that part out, and just broadcast uh, the games audio, the audio version of the games through in-house. And a lot of people are probably wondering, well, why? Well, why would they do that? Well, because it's so the team can control the narrative. The team would do it because it makes more sense revenue-wise. It makes more sense uh, PR-wise. They can control the narratives that are coming out of the game, and that's all it is now. What do you think is going on in the world now? It's all about control and controlling the narrative. When you put something out online, or whether it's a tweet or an Instagram post, a TikTok or whatever, you are putting it out to control your own narrative. When I record this podcast every day or right now during off-season mode every other day or so, I put it out so I can give you guys my narrative on what I believe is going on in Canucks land, right? That is what the way things are going. People have, we all have all these platforms and ability to say what we want to say, do what we want to do and express our opinion. And that is exactly what sports teams are finding out now. Hey, Why would we have to pay or, you know, why do we have to outsource this this to another entity where we can just make it in-house, give it to our consumers, right? We're not bound by a CBA deal, unlike the TV rights deal where, you know, Rogers has that or, you know, TNT in the States or ESPN. We can do this and control the narrative and control the revenue stream where, that right there is, the, I believe, the new way. And you see that a lot now with, you know, a lot of teams, especially in the NFL right now, taking their own, making their own hard knocks behind the scenes, 
style shows, whether it's through YouTube or whatever, because they control the narrative and they can put stuff out there that makes it look like their franchise is in a positive light. That is all this is. Um, I know a lot of people are saying, well, this isn't journalistic integrity and stuff like that. Well, if you look at the landscape of sports media, there's not a lot of people that are true journalists anymore out there. A lot of people now just want to spit off hot takes. They don't want to do the research. They don't actually understand the sports. They just want to say things to get clicks. And that is that. Where there, I don't know if journalism and sports journalism and all that has changed so much with the explosion of social media where everybody now can be a journalist. Anybody can be an insider. Anybody can voice their opinion. You're seeing people online who do not go through any formal training or whatnot pop off in the sports media industry and be getting jobs at very prominent networks just because they were able to blow, blow up on social media and to more power to them. I mean, I wish I could do that. I did it the old, or I'm doing it the old school way, uh, grinding my teeth and, you know, trying to learn everything. I went to school for it. Um, but that's, you know, might be that that's the way I did it. Other people do it another way. That's respectable. I can only respect other people's hustles. And when I look at this Canucks uh, internal audio rights situation, it's just a way of the times. It's just a way that things are progressing in our society now where teams now are realizing, Hey, we can control the narrative, of the content we put out. So why don't we do that? We can control what goes out there about our team. We can control how we're covered in, in certain aspects. Right. And that's all the Canucks are trying to do. And I think this is the beginning. I think more and more teams are going to do that. Um, and I think it's just the way it is. And I think that, you know, you look at the MLS, they took it, moved to the Apple, they're looking for more national present, you know, you know, presentation and stuff like that. And I think it's just it's all about content and it's all about controlling the narrative. And that's what the Canucks are doing. So that is that. That's my little radio rant or media rant on the landscape of sports media in the little country of Canada and the province of British Columbia with the efforts on the Canucks radio rights. But coming up after the break, we're gonna get into the meat and potatoes of this episode where we're gonna discuss. The Athletic, who did a piece on the Vancouver Canucks and their rank of their NHL pipeline. But first, I want to talk to you guys about the fine folks at betonline.net. Betonline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check in all your betting needs, find all your favorite sports and events as the number one online source for odds, lines, and games. Find reviews and news of every league, including Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, and even golf. Bet online continues to be the top online resource for all your sporting wagering information from live in game betting scores po- and podcasts. They have you covered. Head to bet online today or use your mobile device to learn more about the action happening today. Bet online where the game starts. Okay, we are back. Locked on Canucks, the show that keeps you locked in on all things Vancouver Canucks. So I discussed the Canucks changing their in-house to maybe an in-house radio motive while sticking on the media. The Athletic came out today with the pipeline rankings of NHL teams. Um, And the Canucks finished 14th, middle of the pack. And it was mostly because of how good Quinn Hughes is, how good he will be for the extended period of time. And, of course, you have guys like Vasily Podkolzin, Jonathan Lekarimaki, you know, players that can develop into top six wingers. Uh, in 2021, this the Canucks, of course, were number seven in the pipeline. Well, a reason why they dra- they moved uh, down a slot was because one of the biggest reasons why is that Elias Pettersson has graduated out of that kind of prospect young player pipeline and out into a regular full-fledged NHL. But Quinn Hughes is still there. We know Quinn Hughes uh, was dra- in the seventh overall draft pick in 2018. Um, you know, they ranked him on a tier where I think he – Kind of fits. It's very accurate. I've said it very. Uh, I've said it myself. An elite and a bubble elite NHL player and an NHL All Star. I think Quinn Hughes, as I said before, can be a bona fide All Star every year. But can he be that elite number one, number two, you know, top five defenseman in the league? That's the question that we we, we need to know. You know, we know his his skating is elite. His hockey sense is high end. Um, but his puck skills, you know, it's good. Um, and stuff like that. And, you know, he had a monster season where he was just under a point per game at 22. Um, you know, he has got this. They basically just talk about skating a stride. Um, he's got some regular PK time. He's an offensive-minded player. But 
I think they got Quinn Hughes right. He's a bona fide all-star player who has the chance to be a bubble elite, you know, a top five defenseman in the league if he can really work on all aspects of his game. But if he was just to continue on the trajectory he's on right now, he should be a bona fide all-star. The next player they have was Vasily Podkolzin. Of course, the 20-year-old is coming off his rookie year. Um, and the Canucks, you know, sorry, the Athletic projected him to be a top and middle lineup player. So, you know, a you know top six guy, you know, second line guy, what he would project out as. And I think that is kind of where we would all seem to fit. I don't think Pod Colson has that elite, you know, game breaker skill level. And by the report that the Athletic did, they gave him a, you know, skating is below average, which I think he can work on. Puck skills are average. Hockey sense is average. But he's got a high compete. He's got a high motor. Um, and I think that will help. I think all this other stuff, the puck skills, the hockey sets of the skating can be worked on. That is something you can work on. There's something you can't change, though, is your compete level and your motor and your drive. When you, if that is high, that is a true indication that you want to get better as a player. And I've said this a million times before, guys, as you all know. I think Vasily Podkolzin and his teammates have all said it. He has a high motor. He wants to be great. He wants to be good. And I think with that compete level and that work ethic, the skills will just grow and get better and better. And I think this has a chance to potentially be, rather than a bubble top and middle of the lineup, but I think Pod Colson has the ability to potentially be a bona fide top six forward who could score, who could play a 200 foot game, who can, you know, be an all round good player. I think Vasily Pod Colson has a chance to maybe, just maybe, make a couple all star appearances if. He's surrounded by the right pieces. So I think they got Pod Coles in, in the right realm, but I think he has a little bit more higher upside because I love that his compete level. I love his work ethic. And I think when you have that as a baseline, the skills and other stuff can really develop when you have that high work ethic. So I think Pod Coles has a chance to top out as a, you know, a top six forward, a bona fide top six forward who can, you know, cause some damage and be an immediate impact player when he gets to that level. The next player is the guy that we're going to talk about after. Uh, you know, this last segment is Niels Hoglander, of course, the second round pick. They project him to be a middle of the lineup player where he's got elite puck skills, but he's average skating and average ho- and below average hockey sense and above average compete. Um, he struggled under Bruce Brudro. Um, and I'm not going to dive too much into it because I want to save it for the last bit of the show. Um, but I think this is a very big season for Niels Hoglander. And I think he has a chance to either cement himself to be a part of this core or he'll be on his way out. The number four player is, of course, the Canucks' last first-round pick, Jonathan Lecaire-Mackey. Um, right now, they project him to have everything average except the shot, which we know. But And they project him to be a middle-of-the-lineup player. I think, again, it's way too early to judge this. He's a very skilled winger um, who's playing in Sweden. He's got an NHL shot. Um I think I need to see more. That's what it comes down to. I need to see more uh, over the next couple of seasons before he gets to the NHL and how his game grows, how his body matures, how he can, you know, does he get stronger? This is where we'll get the indication whether Jonathan Lekaramaki can be an elite NHL player. Does he want to put the work in? It's too early right now to place a projection on him in my personal opinion. A middle of the sixth lineup guy, I that would be, you know, an even thing. Do I think he has the high-end skill to be, you know, a, a frontline player? For sure. But we don't know. It's too early to tell. Uh, Linus Carlson, 22-year-old, six foot one center, uh, was acquired via trade. Um, he's projected to play in the NHL. That's what the athletic has him at. He had a good season in the or great season, excuse me, in the SHL, had 46 points in 52 games. Uh, the athletic kind of ranked him as an average player. And I think, you know, as a 22 year old prospect, uh, if you hope he can just, you know, come into the lineup sparsely or just play a bottom six role, uh, that would be very beneficial. Um, I think that they got that kind of right with Linus Carlson. Um, it's, we're going to see if he plays, um, and he plays in Abbotsford and you see, you know, how he does in the AHL, um, how, he, what is competing of how he adjusts the North American game. Uh, that'll be a good indication. So I'm not ex- my ceiling's not too high on Linus Carlson, uh, but if he can do something and you know make this roster, that will be a plus for the Canucks. Uh, there's Dan- Danila Klimovich, 
Uh, of course, the Canucks, who they drafted in the second round in 2021. Again, they have him just projected to be a you know an average NHL player. He had an up and down first pro season uh, in the AHL before he you know got in the slump in the second half. Uh, he has all the offensive tools. Um, he has the the shooting, the skill, and you know he's a you know a pro. He's a he seems like a power play guy, um, but he does. He's a bit more of a perimeter player. He's not the fleetest of foot, and we all know in the NHL you need to be fast. And you need to, you know, have that ability to keep up with the play. And if you can't do that, then you can't play. It's as simple as that. Um, and I believe if Danila Klimovic has a skill but cannot fix his speed, uh, the Canucks are already pretty stacked at wingers anyway. So it's going to be tough to crack the lineup for the foreseeable future. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if Danila Klimovic can, you know, become an immediate impact player. But he's only 19. So he'll have another opportunity in Abbotsford to get better, stronger, faster, improve his game. And if he can do that, then potentially a roster spot would open. And that's what the Canucks need. The Canucks need these young guys to start pushing these older players either out or pushing them to play at a higher level so you know the Canucks can get their maximum output out of them. Uh, last player, they mentioned a few others, but I want to talk about Yoni Yermo, the Finnish defenseman who is, because we have other than Quinn, who haven't really mentioned any defenseman. He is a you know a six foot four, 190 pound defenseman. Who can skate well for his size, has offensive touch. Um, and he I'm excited for this team. I saw him play, you know, in, in Finland for the you know the world juniors. And I think this player has a chance to make the NHL and be an impact player. I think Finland has a very good pipeline. They're in a golden generation of hockey right now in Finland. And I think that if Yoni Yermo can, you know, make this roster and eventually and you know play in Abbotsford, um, I think. <clears throat> I think Yoni Yermo has a very good chance to, you know, play very well. You know, he just came off a, a, a World Junior Championship where, um, you know, he did very well. You know, he, you know, helped Finland out, and you know, they fell in the world. They fell in the uh, gold medal game to Canada in overtime, which was you know, a very impressive game. You know, he played six, the 13, 16 minutes, excuse me, uh, the fifth most for uh, their seven defensemen. Um, Again, I think, you know, he can play, you know, he can, you know, be that guy. Uh, so I think Yoni Yermo can be a player. That's what I think. Um, but like I said, I want to get to one player we mentioned on the pipeline, Niels Hoaglander. And coming back for this final break, the last part of the show, we're going to dive into Niels Hoaglander and how this season is a make or break for him. And welcome back, everybody, to Locked on Canucks, the show that keeps you locked in on all things Canucks. So talked about the Canucks pipeline and we mentioned Niels Hoaglander. Um, and I mentioned that he can project to be a middle six four, but this is a very big season for Niels Hoaglander because the Canucks, of course, added Andre Kuzmenko, Ilya Mikheyev. They now have 10 players who can technically fit into your top nine. Uh, you know, he was used, you know, last year. He's probably going to start on the fourth line. Um, He, you know, after a rookie season where he had 27 points in 56 games, you know, he's had a high, more opportunity with Travis Green and stuff like that. But then, you know, he was just dropped up near 12 minutes a game under uh, Bruce Brujo, less than players than Yuho Lamico, Matthew Highmore, and Alex Chason. Um, he had just eight points in 35 games before Brujo got there. Um, Brujo was open saying that he's not the best defensively. So, to me, when I look at Niels Hoaglander, he has the skill, he has the ability, but where does he fit on this lineup? Is it just the simple fact that he's the odd man out, right? Can he is is there not enough space for him? And I think if he does not get up to a good start this year and does not figure things out and cannot cement himself somewhere in this Canucks lineup and find a role for himself, he will be out of Vancouver because you can keep a guy like Andre Kuzmenko. You can keep, you know, you have a sign a guy like Ilya Mikheyev. It's not going to, there's not like there's available open spots on the wing with whether, you know, either JT Miller or Elias Patterson is going to play the one of the wings and split time at center on the first line with Brock Besser. Then you have Kuzmenko, Mikheyev, Pod Colson, um, Tanner Pearson, you know, whoever you want to put out there, you're going to have guys that are going to need to, you know, find a role and carve out a role for themselves. So when I look at this roster, I just I don't know if Niels Hoaglander can separate himself from anybody. And I think when I look at Hoaglander, 
can he be used to get a defensive asset? Will some team want to be out there? Be like, hey, we see his skill level. We see some, maybe he just needs an opportunity to, with, with us. And could the Canucks take advantage of that or risk giving up on a young player to, you know, solve their defensive issues? Can they do that? I don't know. But what I do know is that the, this season is massive for Niels Hogan if he wants to stay in Vancouver. Um, otherwise, he will be on his way out. Um, and I think the Canucks will just have to move on because, again, if he's not producing, he's not separating himself from the pack. There's just no role for a player with his skill set on the bottom six unless he carves out a role there and you know, learns how to change his game. Uh, so that is that. That is all the time we have for today on Locked on Canucks. I want to thank you for making Locked on Canucks your first listen of the day. Now, your second listen, Locked on NHL. Locked on experts give you a daily 30-minute podcast on all things NHL all year long. Stay up to date in the hockey world. Locked on NHL, your daily 30-minute podcast. Guys, take care, stay safe, and I will talk to you tomorrow.